Hello everyone, my name is Tom Graham and welcome to Synthetic Futures, first ever live stream event. Um, today we're here for the panel uh, entitled How to Copyright Synthetic Foundations, Building the Metaverse and Everything Else. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is basically um, have a one hour discussion um, with these three fantastic guests that we have that I'll introduce in a second. But before we get to that, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a rundown on what Synthetic Futures is. So it's really a community of people interested in the future of reality. It's everything that we see around us um, and the role that technology is playing in changing and adding to and augmenting um, the idea of what we think is real. Uh, so we're talking about AI, deep fakes, synthetic media, virtual reality, and everything in between. Uh, taking part in the community are individuals, uh, companies, organizations um, across virtual reality, technology, crypto, uh, marketing, brands, talent, etc. everything through there. And what we're doing is uh, kind of shaping a positive future for synthetic media in its many, many different forms. Uh, so before I introduce our fantastic guests, uh, three of which, you know, uh, well, all three of which are high-flying legal eagles, uh, as opposed to myself, who is a lowly legal pigeon, uh, there will also be a chance to ask some questions at the end. So we'll have 10 minute Q&A session. And if you would like to ask questions, please um, go through Synthetic Futures community discord that you can find uh, in any of the live streams um, and ask those questions directly. Uh, and they'll filter back to me. And um, at the very end, in the last 10 minutes, we'll get around to them. So our guest today, Nikki Pope, great to have you here. Uh, is a senior director of AI and legal ethics at NVIDIA, previously a practicing lawyer, and has a deep industry expertise in thinking about AI and applied ethics. Kelsey Farish, uh, Kelsey, so I'll, you go, you may as well wave, um, but then I just realized that all your names are down the bottom, so it doesn't really make a huge difference. But um, anyway, Kelsey is a media and technology lawyer at DAC Beechcroft here in London. She's one of Europe's leading legal experts on legal issues around synthetic media and manipulated content. Last but not least, Agnes Venema. She's joining us from Malta, where she's an academic and researcher at both the University of Malta and the National Intelligence Academy of Romania. She specializes in national security and image intelligence as a frequent commentator and writer on all things synthetic media and the law. As for myself, uh, my name is Tom Graham. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Metaphysic, a company that focuses on creating hyper-real synthetic content um, and among things uh, that you may have seen online with the viral deep Tom Cruise videos, uh, which are on TikTok, that kind of um, very realistic synthetic media is what we do. Um, I used to be a practicing lawyer, um, but about 10 years ago, I switched over to technology companies. So uh, all of the blunders um, and misstatements are my own, and I look forward to being uh, duly corrected by uh, the much more experienced uh, in all things legal members of our, of our panel today. So um, before we get going on the substantive stuff, I'd uh, love to give you guys a chance to um, give a little introduction to yourself, uh, maybe spend a minute highlighting anything interesting that you're working on or really interesting things that you see um, around law and synthetic media today. Um, maybe we'll start with Agnes. Yeah, hi. Thanks for, uh, for having me. I'm uh, really pleased to be on this panel. Uh, so the reason why I'm here as a researcher in intelligence and national security is because I did I do have a, a human rights background, so that's where my legal um, background comes in. And one of the things I'm working on currently is a book chapter on disinformation and deep fakes for a handbook on um, disinformation and uh, national security. So this fits right in uh, with that what I'm doing. Thank you. Fantastic, Kelsey. Um, I'd just like to say that, um, Tom, although you might call yourself a, a legal pigeon, actually one of the best parts about being a practicing lawyer is that we get to work with people like you. And um, my expertise is really you know, on the intellectual property side of things, personality, publicity, basically how we as individuals, as well as celebrities, present themselves in the online eco ecosystem. So when it comes to film, TV, Hollywood, that sort of thing, as well as you know implications for the everyday person, that's really where my interests come in. So I've done a lot of research and work advising clients who operate in the film and TV space. Fantastic. And Nikki. Oh, you're on mute, Nikki, I think. Yeah, Perfect. I know. I just noted that I muted, noticed that I muted myself. Um, 
So I came into this whole space of um, AI in a probably a weird sort of way. I was working at Santa Clara Law teaching and I um, got involved in uh, the, use of, the use of algorithms in the criminal justice system. And that led me, when you, when you think about uh, deep fakes and synthetic media, um, we started a conversation about how this will impact um, um, trials and what is evidence and what's real evidence versus fake evidence and how this is going to impact the criminal justice system and the civil system for that matter um, going forward. And so that you know, ultimately led me down this, this AI path and, um, and here I am today working at NVIDIA instead of teaching law to you know, scare law students. Fantastic, and where, where are you based currently? I'm in San Jose, California. Perfect. Okay. So we are spread right across the world. Um, and we are going to, I guess, do what good lawyers do and try to define some terms um, before we jump into the substantive uh, side of the discussion, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. So I guess the big one here, uh, and one that viewers may be um, struggling to get their heads around a little bit, or just to think about the scope of it, is um, the term synthetic media. Um, so I will you know, give what I think is a little bit of an exposition of that. And um, then we maybe all try to add to it and um, help uh, our viewer who may not be that familiar with exactly what that one is. Um, then we'll discuss uh, some of the great legal implications and the really interesting stuff that's happening in the space. So um, my idea about synthetic media is that it is uh, content or media, it could be video or voice, um, which has been created with the help of uh, an AI, uh, some kind of artificial intelligence, some kind of computer program has done uh, a large part of the heavy lifting of creating that content. Um, and so you may be able to create content that never previously existed, like um, doing a deep fake of Marilyn Monroe, even though she has passed, you can kind of bring that character back to life. And so in some ways, it's hard for humans to do that on their own using traditional methods. And it creates a lot of uh, kind of creative possibilities. But with those possibilities, um, some potential downfalls. Uh, so who would like to add to that definition in some way or, or some element of it that I've missed? I think one um, aspect of synthetic media that may get lost is we think that it's new and it's been around a long time. Tom and I, Tom, you and I were talking about my days before law school when I was in advertising and we would routinely doctor photographs um, to present a better picture. If it was a hair, uh, a hair commercial or a hair, a shampoo ad, the person's hair was volumized. Or um, if it was cereal, we didn't actually use real milk because the cereal would look bad. So we used this oily white paste that looked like milk, but it wasn't. And there was no requirement to um, disclose to, to the viewer that what they were looking at or the, the reader that what they were looking at was not authentic. Um, and so um, uh, synthetic media has been around a long, long time. It's just now that computers can do it. I think we're paying a little more attention to what, what could possibly be done and how far we can push uh, the synthesis. Perfect. So we're kind of adding to our definition that it is um, like if a photograph is exactly representative of reality, it's been in some way manipulated, um, Photoshop, uh, photos, anything like that, by human hands, by computers entirely of their own. Uh, I think Kelsey and Agnes, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I mean, um, I really wanted to just echo what Nikki says, because that's advertising, but also if you look at the, the space that I work in, intelligence, national security, you know, psychological operations uh, by militaries have been going on for decades, if not centuries. Now, they didn't always used to use um, doctored images, but still, some of the first doctored images go back to, uh, to I, I, think, I think it was an uh, early American president um, where we were looking at newspaper print, right? So, so that's how long this has been going on. And as Nikki rightfully says, it's just now that we can, we have this computing power that allows us to, first of all, scrape a lot of imagery from the internet, which gives us data that we can use 
to train these systems. And second of all, to not have to really put in the manpower, you can actually put the machine to sleep and go to, or, or to work and go to sleep. Those two things I think are compounding and just speeding up the process, what was, which was already really put in place a, a very long time ago. Kelsey? I think that's really interesting. And actually when I was doing a lot of my research on the application of AI in the film and TV industry, I found out that actually the first computer generated face for a film actually happened in the 1970s. So before I was born. So um, it's it's been a long time coming. I think the real distinction, however, is you know, we're used to going into a cinema or flipping through a magazine and thinking that's gonna be fake. Either a cinematographer or an advertising exec or someone at a fashion shoot has altered it. What we're seeing now is the distinction is between a fake world and the real world that's constantly blurring. And, and Agnes will know this from her disinformation and national security work. Um, but what's really encouraging to me is seeing how people in my generation, so the millennials, as well as the younger generation are really starting to push back on that. And we're seeing that when people's photographs are being edited without their permission, so for example, you'll have celebrities like Beyonce or Solange, when their hair is being edited without consent, people are standing up and pushing back on it. And I do think that there is an appetite amongst the public for people, especially companies and Hollywood film studios, to be more upfront and transparent about how they're manipulating images. Again, it's not that a manipulated image is wrong or bad, it's how we're actually using that. Yeah, I think to, um, to, to piggyback off what Kelsey is saying, um, because we had a degree of skepticism about advertising and what's in a film and, and we, you saw Jurassic Park, you didn't actually think there were dinosaurs. So because we've had a healthy degree of skepticism as we approach those things, um, I think the fact that we have accepted things that like newsprint or videos of, of famous people or politicians or what have you have not been doctored in the past, um, there's more of an interest now or desire to have those types of manipulations disclosed up front, whether there is a, uh, the, the question is whether there is a legal obligation or an ethical obligation. But um, I think there's more of a push to be transparent about what is real and what is not real because it's really difficult now for us to know what is and is not real. I mean, when I first saw the Tom Cruise deep fakes, I thought that I was like, Oh my God, that's Tom Cruise. And then for a minute, it's like, okay, that's really not Tom Cruise, but it's it's hard to tell. Yeah, I, I believe that we've probably turned a corner in terms of what AI can do in creating stuff uh, and content that looks exactly like um, content created with traditional cameras and using traditional means. Um, and, and this is in video, which is a different threshold of um, computation and effort and say, uh, manipulating one image. So I think it's a really fascinating um, uh, thread for us to pull on. Um, I know that recently uh, in Norway, legislators uh, created a law to um, prevent people from publishing ads, uh, advertising beauty products without labeling them as manipulated where they had been manipulated in order to make the models seem um, more attractive or look different from how they look in real life. Um, obviously big implement uh, implications for beauty standards, particularly among young people. Um, so I think that maybe we're talking about synthetic media is manipulated or changed in some way from what the reality is that that media portrays. We're talking about that in a historical context and today in terms of being able to do fully hyper real video. Uh, so uh, I'll throw this open to the floor. What kinds of tools uh, do lawmakers and policymakers have at their disposal to think about how to create norms and standards for manipulated media today? I think that's a, a very interesting question. And I, we, we touched upon it slightly before uh, in, in, in a little discussion that we had beforehand. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm keen on highlighting is that not everything needs new legislation, right? There are a lot of things that are happening with deep fakes that we see right now. And of course, I come from a, the world of shadows, if you will. So I look at the things like 
uh, people being defrauded, um, people being uh, imitated uh, you, uh, with, with the attempt to, or with the goal to defraud. I'm looking at uh, image-based sexual violence, which uh, in, in this sort of common word is called, um, um, sorry about that, is called um, revenge porn. But what my point about all these things is, or a lot of these things, is that there is legislation already out there. There is legislation that says, you know, you cannot defraud someone. There is legislation that that in in certain countries that says, you know, well, uh, posting intimate images of people are is illegal. However, does that already include the digital angle? Does that include digitally manipulated footage? That's I feel for a lot of this that legislation is something that we really need to look at. Do we really need completely new legislation? Is a small adaptation of what we have already good enough? to achieve the goal. And also not just for this type of, you know, manipulated media, who knows what we're going to get in 50 years from now, you know? So if we, if we create legislation that includes the option of having digital manipulation in whatever type of way, um, we can already move a step towards making sure this is included in existing legislation and then see, okay, what else do we need? Yeah, I think there, um, uh, to Agnes's point, I think there exists case law, at least in the US, um, and laws already covering um, a lot of what the harm could be from, from deep fakes. Um, I remember the, from law school, the Bette Midler case where they were trying to use her song, Do You Wanna Dance? And they wanted her to sing it. I think it was a Ford ad commercial. And she didn't want to sing it, so they got one of her background singers who sat, who could sound like her and imitate her voice to imitate her voice um, on that commercial. And she won that lawsuit because they they created a fake Bed Midler soundtrack for this commercial where she had expressly refused to do it. So I think there are laws that are that currently exist. We just have to know that we can apply them. I think that's, and again, I'm going to play devil's advocate because I've done a lot of research on, um, you know, the Bette Midler case and how that applies to California's right of publicity, which is really strong in the U.S. As, as you'll understand, that's where Hollywood is, right? Now, again, being one of the lawyers in the room, um, it's incumbent to say that we do have the laws, but there's a big caveat. Bette Midler was able to win that case because she's known as a singer. She was able to win it because she was able to demonstrate that she had some sort of commercial damage done to her brand, her persona, right? Now, for your average person, so for me, Kelsey Ferris, just a random lawyer, right? If someone was to make a deep fake of me, and it wasn't necessarily a form of image-based sexual abuse, so that's what Agnes was talking about, if it doesn't fall neatly into that, that category of like revenge porn, and if it doesn't fall neatly into the category of, um, you know, false endorsements or some sort of um, brand damage or commercial problem, where do my remedies lie? Now, of course, you've probably come to a lawyer like, like me or any of the other people on this panel to discuss the specifics. But I think collectively, again, as Agnes said, it's not just about the law. It's about educating ourselves about how we can protect our image online and knowing what our remedies are. So for example, going to the Facebooks and saying, hey, wait a second, this is against your policy to have a deep fake or another form of manipulated content. Can you remove it? So it's not just laws, it's tech policies, it's education, it's just being a, a nice human being more generally speaking. So there are a lot of different facets at play. And, and if I can just quickly piggyback on what, what Kelsey said, because that's a super important point. And it, it came up in discussions with the, um, uh, the New Zealand Parliament, in, in, uh, for which I, I testified, and one of the problems that came up with this, and that was specifically in relation to image-based sexual violence, but it goes for any of this, really, is that the onus was always on the victim to get these types of things removed from the platforms, and if you've already been traumatized by these types of things, or your reputation has already been damaged by it, and for whatever other way, you know, that should not be on you to get that removed that there should be an obligation, at least in my perspective, there should be an obligation on the platforms to say, listen, you need to do your everything in your power to get that removed rather than have, as was the case, a law student in Australia trying to get images removed from Pornhub that she's on 
and it keeps on being reposted and reposted and she keeps on having to send takedown notices. That's and, really yeah. an unfair position that you put a victim in. I was just gonna say, let's be real, lawyers are expensive, right? Like not every victim, especially people who are, you know, at a disadvantage economically or socially for whatever reason, not everyone knows to find a lawyer. And if you do find a lawyer, how do you afford them? So there's a big question here too about responsibility. And this is probably Nikki's bag where she's talking about, you know, who is responsible for taking advantage of things. And then, and then Perfect. just one more, just one more element because it spirals, right? We're talking about, okay, so then you can afford a lawyer. That's great. That's wonderful if you have one. But um, if we're talking about affording a lawyer, the legislation in New Zealand did not until, at least until it's, it's, it's changed, does not allow for victims of these types of deep fakes to access uh, legal aid because it's technically not a, a sex crime yet. So these people are also disadvantaged by the fact that the legislation hasn't kept up. Interesting. So um, would it be fair to say that a takeaway for our community would be that um, there are, we have a large number of established fields of law which cover um, many different elements and that by potentially adding to those in small ways or at least including certain types of activity um, around manipulation, um, deception, particular types of uh, things specific to synthetic media, we could go some way. But then to your point, Kelsey, um, that in terms of access to justice and access to remedies, um, there is a lot of work to be done in scaling that infrastructure, that legal infrastructure to accommodate kind of everyday people, regular users of the internet and various platforms. And I, I imagine that as we move to a multi-platform metaverse where there's lots of synthetic media everywhere, and instead of say Facebook using our data to service ads, they're using our data to create our faces and our likenesses and our voices in virtual worlds. Uh, that we need to address these problems to kind of scale up. And that, I, create, I guess, creates an interesting tension between legislators uh, and governments versus technology companies and policy, um, which I think is a great segue into um, one of the things that we just highlighted about, like, who is responsible, um, Section 230, and, um, you know, the role of big technology companies in, in meeting these demands in terms of justice. Um, so maybe just to, to lead that off, um, because Nikki, you are right in the middle of thinking about ethics and AI um, at one of the leaders uh, in terms of the metaverse and synthetic media, um, NVIDIA. Um, what, are, what are your initial perspectives on, how, how would you frame this discussion for us around responsibility of, of big companies uh, and platforms? Well, so it's gonna sound a little uh, Pollyanna, I suppose, but my, my initial reaction is, you know, something that my grandmother taught me and that I'm sure everybody's grandmother taught them, which is do the right thing. She was thing an elite deep work. faker, Nikki's grandmother, <laughs> one of the best deep fakers, <laughs> big YouTube channel. But yeah. but yeah, as to, you know, do the right thing, be good, be nice to other people. You know, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you start there, um, you can go a long way to behaving in a responsible, ethical, you know, concerned, empathetic manner. And um, I, I think that's the first step. Um, I think another step doesn't even need to go as far as legislation. Um, we were just talking about, at least in the United States, and, and I believe in the EU as well, you have agencies that regulate or that provide uh, interpretations of the law. And so you can have a law on the books that does not necessarily affect deep fakes or synthetic media or a lot of the technology we have now, but the agency that um, governs that area can create a new guidance that says, this is what this means. So when you have the Federal Trade Commission in the US saying, um, section five means when you say unfair competition, it also means not deceiving consumers. And one way that you deceive consumers is by creating uh, uh, fake images or fake videos or fake content and not disclosing it to them so that they believe this is real. 
that that's a that's a, to me that's an easy way to do it. The question is whether um, we get uh, 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 regulators to 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 make those steps, and if they understand um, uh, what their responsibility is in in that in that regard. So to um, to answer your question maybe more directly is um, I think one of the um, concerns is making sure that the people who are interpreting laws as well as the people who are drafting laws understand themselves how this technology works. And I'm not sure they do. I just remember um, when Mark Zuckerberg was testifying before Congress and uh, one of the Congress members basically said, well, how does Facebook um, make its money? And Zuckerberg like sips some water and just goes, uh, Senator, we sell advertising. And that was where the penny really dropped. And it's not just, you know, senators and congressmen and policymakers around the world who don't understand this. It's even people, you know, our age, even tech lawyers, a lot of tech lawyers don't understand um, how it really works in practice, right? Um, so I think the education is is so hugely important. Um, and there is a societal impetus, I think, as well, to ensure that people are aware of these issues because they they are real and they don't just impact celebs or you know politicians. They impact all of us. And certainly if they aren't impacting us today, they will do tomorrow and in the months and years to come, especially as the technology becomes more sophisticated. If I can add to that, one of the conversations I had with legislators kind of surrounded this idea of, okay, well, how good does a deep fake have to be in order for basically it to do harm, right? Because this whole idea about the, the law in this case was about how do you prove harm? And my point was, it doesn't need to be great in order to look realistic enough to do harm, even a fairly poorly made deep fake can still be very, very harmful to people either because there is a, a mob out there out for blood because somebody goes, well, where there's smoke, there's fire. You must have done something to deserve this. Uh, there's all sorts of ways in which people will go, oh, well, if it's out there, it must be true. Um, and we see a lot of that, you know, already happening in sort of um, a lot of a lot of echo chambers and circles where where conspiracy theories are being are being um, launched. So the the fact that um, we're we're doing part of this education is also very much educating legislators, right? Say, okay, you don't need something perfectly done, Hollywood, you know, uh, grade deepfake in order for it to be harmful to the general public. And, and we should really look indeed, as Kelsey said, uh, and as Nikki also emphasized, that the education part of it is really important. And I think that part of it was what we're doing today. So I'm really grateful for this platform in a way. Perfect. Um, I wanted to drill in a little bit more on, say, the uh, interaction and the role between legislators, people who make law and policy in the official capacity, and the role of big tech companies who create the platforms and their internal policies and decisions um, make up the user activity and shape, you know, shape a lot of things about our lives. Um, so I guess a, a good lens to look at that um, is to frame it in terms of what people are really familiar with, um, uh, Section 230 in the US, uh, which is replicated in other jurisdictions around the world, uh, which um, please, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but basically gives um, platforms which publish content like Facebook, uh, YouTube, etc., immunity from liability um, regarding what's actually in that content. So they are not liable for kind of hate speech that's published on their platform. Um, and that is kind of a, a foundational law in terms of the history of the internet because it created the space for technology companies to grow and experiment with new forms of content distribution. And this may be in opposition to say newspapers, which do have editorial standards and are held to a different type of um, standard in terms of what you print in the New York Times. Um, is that 
every that's a correct uh, statement on section 230. I mean, Nikki is probably best placed to talk about this, but Kelsey, I think it, it's really important to remember too that section 230 came out in like the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, is... And let's just think about how much has changed in the last 10 years or so, right? Like Instagram wasn't around when I was in high school. Um, and that's just been in the last 10 or so years. So think about how much has changed in the last 20 when that legislation came in. Yeah. And so I guess that goes to my question on some level. Um, you know, you have something from basically the birth of the internet, section 230, um, and today we have much more going on and very many dramatic instances where social media has created um, uh, social movements, et cetera, which, which are potentially detrimental to young people, to democracy, to other things like that. Um, do we... I guess it's a, uh, a hard question to answer, but do we think that lawmakers have the tools uh, and have the ability inside our current political systems, et cetera, to, to actually get to the heart of addressing some of these um, potential um, issues created by synthetic media um, playing out in the metaverse, et cetera, um, given our current legal infrastructure? Do we need to overhaul it? Do we need to do it incrementally? Um, what, wh where do we fall on this? Well, I think if you just talk about section, look, look at section 230, um, and my my uh, internet law professor is going to chop my head off um, when if he hears me say this, um, I think section 230 needs a, a serious overhaul. Um, one of the, um, and as Kelsey was describing it, um, and, and quite accurately so, the where, where things I think have started to fall apart is when you look at some, uh, a publication like the New York Times, um, it is held to a higher standard because it is assumed to vet and investigate information that it presents as facts. So the New York Times doesn't just open up its pages and let people say anything, except maybe for op-eds where they let people say kind of anything. But then those are op-eds, they're not presented as news. On, on social media platforms, there is no moderator. And, and yeah, there's content moderation, but there's not. There is no moderator, so anyone can say anything about anything. We've always had that, at least in the United States where I live, um, you've always had the ability to go and stand on the corner or go stand in a park and get a megaphone or a microphone and say whatever you want, whether it's true or not. But the number of people that you could impact or reach by that method was limited. Now I can reach millions of people around the world with one crazy lie and there's no one to keep me from doing it. The, um, the, the social media platforms can say, we're sorry, but Section 230, you know, excuses us from liability. And if, Tom, if I say something that is harmful professionally about you, first you have to find me. You know, I probably am not posting as Nikki Pope, you know, NVIDIA employee or even Nikki but Pope. I'm pretty sure that you're in the library, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can find me here. But, you know, because of the anonymity of the internet, I can say something horrible. I can damage your reputation. And it may be impossible for you to find me. And I, I may not even be, you're in the UK. What if I'm in Borneo? Like, how are you going to deal with that? And so it, it, we've created a, um, a, an open platform for people to make their statements, but we've also created a bit of a monster where we, it's, it's hard to control um, what is being said by whom and, and where. I'm going to jump in here and just say that this is an ongoing debate around much of the world, but especially in the UK, when we're considering whether or not people should be allowed to be anonymous online. A couple of years ago, for example, they were thinking about in order to, to view uh, pornography websites, which are indeed legal here in the UK, you would have to submit your credit card and a copy of your ID. And then you think, oh my goodness, there's going to be a, a database somewhere with my phone and my number and my age and 
you know, some people look at these things and they think, yeah, anonymity is bad because when people are anonymous online, they do bad things. So no one should be anonymous on Twitter. But look at it on the flip side. Anonymity gives people who are in marginalized communities, perhaps they're LGBT, um, perhaps they're dealing with abusive relationships and they want to speak about their problems in a safe space. Being anonymous online is also often a very important security blanket that can sometimes come down to the matters of life and death, right? So again, being anonymous online, sometimes people look at it as a bad thing, but it can also be a very good thing too. So we have to be very careful and very nuanced when we're looking at these laws. And it goes back to my original point, lawmakers are sometimes not completely alive to the ins and outs and the weird and wonderful complexities of social media. And if I can tag on to that, because I absolutely agree. Coming, you know, tapping into my human rights background, human rights defenders will be some of the first who need to be anonymous online because otherwise they cannot do their work. So I, I fully agree. But going back to Nikki's point, she said, you know, um, there, there's the law, but also as an ethicist, I say, I say, okay, well, the law might allow you to repost anything you want online, but what about the ethics of you as a platform for not allowing um, certain messages to go viral, certain content to go viral. What about that obligation where you say, okay, well, you can post it, but we are just going to make sure that on our side, from the algorithm side, we're going to make sure that, um, you know, these types of messages aren't going to go viral. There aren't going to be that visible. You know, would that, I'm just throwing it out there as a question, would that have um, limited what happened in, in Burma, Myanmar, for example? You know, uh, what about content um, moderation when you look at the guy who, who shot up mosques in, in Christchurch in New Zealand? You know, what if you prevented that from having gone viral, basically, uh, because that was a live feed? These are, these are questions of ethics. And again, as a human rights, um, um, someone with a human rights background, freedom of speech, but freedom of speech only goes so far. At some point, you move into hate speech, but sometimes at the far, far end of the spectrum, you move into incitement to hate and incitement to even things like genocide. So that's one thing that I, I often hear also people on, on the internet, of course, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in these discussions, but I have freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is not the same thing as freedom from consequence. And that's something I think is very important for people to realize. That's so interesting. I think, um... I'd really like to um, focus our attention to like thinking about uh, the generational shifts too. And so like we're aiming at the future, like what does it mean for young people today? So like, I guess uh, thinking about this discussion we're just having today about lawmakers and technology platforms and, you know, Nikki, you brought up the person on the, on, in the public square with a megaphone on the soapbox. Uh, increasingly, I think it's likely that, you know, um, younger and younger people will spend more and more time entirely communicating through these digital channels, through um, platforms protected by Section 230 and other uh, things, and increasingly not get information which has been vetted by journalists or, or by the New York Times, et cetera. And so uh, in my mind, and even when I think about my behavior today online, um, pretty much everything, uh, all information I get goes through these platforms. So uh, I guess the question is, um, as we move towards Generation Z and that becoming the dominant set of behaviors uh, rolling forward, you know, over the next 40 years, um, are, we, are we going to be able to keep up in, in the current paradigm? Are we going to be, um, you know, totally in virtual worlds where there is kind of anybody can say whatever they want and we don't really have um, tools to deal with that? Um, what do you guys think about the you know, the next 40 years, what will be the big challenges? I think, um, and, and when you mentioned digital worlds, because I was thinking metaverse, um, it is, or it, yeah, it, it is frightening <laughs> in a way to think that when you talk about what young people do, like I have a younger nephew who's staying with me temporarily right now, and he spends an awful lot of his time on a computer and in virtual worlds with his friends playing games and doing all sorts of other things. I think that's where a lot of 
interaction may in the future, I don't know if it's 50 years or 30 years or 80 years, but I think that's where a lot of this will take place. And I don't think we are equipped right now to handle that. Um, in the United States, we've gotten rid of civics classes in most schools. So kids don't understand how laws are made or where they come from. Um, we don't have a lot of sort of ethical conversations. Um, the people going to church where presumably you're taught, you know, some principles of behavior in society, um, church, church membership and church attendance has gone down. So all of those things that we used to rely on, and I'm, I think I'm older than everybody on this panel, but some of the things that you remember doing when you were a kid, they aren't there anymore. And so, and they aren't helping um, younger people to uh, conceptualize or understand what's going on in the world. And, um, and now we're gonna lay on top of them the ability to go into a, an environment that is completely uh, made up. And um, like I, I bought a, um, an Oculus, uh, Oculus Rift, or I can't remember, Quest. And, and I'm fascinated by putting on these goggles and going and, and being in places that there's no way I would ever be like space. Um, and, and, and you feel like you're there and you're, you know, I've had people say, you know, you look crazy because they see me standing up doing sort of weird stuff. But in, in my mind, it's the real experience. I, I did a roller coaster ride and I got motion sick. And I was sitting on my sofa. So the so the the real life impact and consequences of this technology, it, it's real. Um, and our brains process it as real. So we have to get a handle on this, or I don't know what, you know, I'll I'll be dead by then, but I don't know what what people who but your virtual to self will live on, Nikki, and that's the key thing. <laughs> yeah, Tom, no virtual me. You I just wanted to see that. I just wanted to say really briefly, just two things. The first is that I'm always surprised actually, um, cause I'm like a nineties kid, right? I, I remember being a kid in the nineties. Um, I'm always surprised when like teenagers today, they don't really understand the concept that like things, once they're out on the internet, they aren't necessarily gonna be deleted. Um, and so there's just kind of this free for all and people sometimes forget that yes, it's true. It may not be fair, but it's true that sometimes things that you say when you're 16 can come back to haunt you when you're 26 or 36. The second thing I wanted to make is totally what we've seen with the coronavirus pandemic. There's certainly been a shift to an online world, right? A virtual world. I don't like saying things are offline and then in real life because now we know that online is real life. But I do want to say that I've been very intrigued to see how people have pushed back against Zoom calls in favor of going back into the office once it's safe to do so again. Um, you know, I really crave going to the theater and seeing live performances because no matter how big your flat screen TV is at home, nothing can really replace that interaction of being in a theater or meeting up with friends for a cocktail. Um, so I do think that in the next couple of years, I think we will start to see some pushback. Um, there will be a rebalancing, I think. So I don't think we're going to go completely virtual just yet, but um, I do think it's one to watch. Let me make one real quick point before uh, we move on. Um, I, I absolutely hear you about children and the need for education, and I'm re really saddened to hear that civics classes are apparently, um, you know, being canceled. But what we should not underestimate is both the digital divide and um, the elderly. If we look at disinformation, the elderly are among the highest group sharing that on social media. And we really need to make sure they're included in all these strategies that we're, we're using to, to make sure people know what we're talking about. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. The um, World Economic Forum actually put out a paper um, about a month ago that looks at the impact of AI on the very young and the very old. And, and proposes um, considering age groups as how um, in, in, in uh, uh, strategies that we have for tackling disinformation. That's fascinating. I think that when we consider who is building these technologies, creating these virtual worlds and the platforms, we're talking about companies which dominate um, 
the, the GDPs of, of many countries, many of the stock market boards are really totally made up by the, the market caps of these companies, uh, the biggest companies in the world. And they have practically unlimited resources, um, especially when you consider that there are um, huge sovereign wealth funds, et cetera, willing to invest a limitless amount of money in creating these new technologies. So it seems that as we move to this new paradigm of metaverse, um, more immersive virtual experiences, which really, you know, kind of consume our reality and the information that we consume, that we should be really thoughtful in designing the systems. Um, and it's incumbent on the technology companies and their unlimited resources to design things, really put that thought into designing um, their products to achieve some of these goals, protecting the elderly, protecting um, young people, uh, other at-risk groups, um, and providing, I guess, um, a, a smooth pathway for lawmakers to um, kind of create laws around what they are doing um, in, in a way that benefits society. Um, that is a great pivot to um, question time, which has officially begun. Um, so um, one question we have here from the audience is about uh, post-mortem privacy, which I guess is the question of whether um, you can create synthetic media, voice recordings, new songs by dead artists, etc. Once somebody has passed, um, can you recreate their likeness? Um, what are your guys' perspectives on uh, should we regulate the creation of post-mortem um, synthetic media likenesses of people? I can pick this up because I've actually done a lot of research on postmortem privacy. Um, so uh, I've looked into it in Germany, France, the UK, Sweden, uh, California. Basically, it depends on where you're based and it depends on what you did before. So um, California, for example, following the death of a famous actor, they uh, came up with a law that said, you know, you can't recreate something using a dead person. But in other parts of the world, you don't really have that right. It comes down to whether or not it's a property right that passes from an estate. So so passes to your heirs or whether it's a human right in which case it ends when you die so a lot of people again Agnes you'd know more about this think that when you die you have no more rights to privacy because it's a human right that attaches to you other people think that privacy is something that you can pass on to your descendants so it really just depends on where you're based and what the specific context is so would one question be um where the harm is, because um, I've, I've, I have not done the res research on this by any stretch of the imagination. But, um, but one thing that I think about is when you're, when you're talking about, a, a, let's just take a famous person. When you talk about a famous person who has died and then you uh, replicate them, their voice, their image, what have you, um, where is the harm? And uh, Kelsey, I guess you've researched this. So my question would be, is since the person is dead, they aren't necessarily harmed. I mean, maybe their reputation is yeah, harmed. Yeah, but... it could be, for example, if, so you take the Star Wars films, right? When you're when you're recreating someone who's passed away, where is the money from like the royalties going? Does it go to their estate? Does, it, does the film studio hold on to it? Are you damaging the reputation of the family more generally? Um, you know, you look at famous people like fashion designers, right? Like Coco Chanel or Audrey Hepburn. Um, if someone were to recreate their image after their death without the requisite permissions in place from a contractual perspective, then it's not so much harm, but unjust enrichment. So someone else mm -hmm. profiting, offer, offering, excuse me, someone else profiting off of them when they shouldn't be. So that's where contract law, human rights law, property law all comes into play, but it's and, complicated. Yeah, and we should also not, not um, underestimate the amount of damage you could do in terms of a disinformation, yeah, disinformation campaign. Uh, take, take what have you, a Pope who has passed away, um, you know, make him say inflammatory things about other religions and just watch the world combust. I mean, that those are actual possibilities um, that would do harm to large groups of people. So uh, from a commercial point of view, that, that's way more Kelsey's, um, Kelsey's wheelhouse, I would say. But from a disinformation and security point of view, there's definitely absolute harms that, that can be done. Okay. Another question from the audience is, is there any international body, regulatory or rulemaking body like the WIPO for IP that could take the international lead for um, thinking about rules and regulations for synthetic media or manipulated media and disinformation?
Is there one? Not well, that it, I, know of. I guess there isn't one, but um, who, who would who would do it? I mean, we, we do have don't we have the International Telecom what is it, Union in, in Geneva? Uh, they they might take the lead on that. I know there's a lot of um, within, for example, within the, the United Nations, but also within the European Union, there's a lot of these sort of um, departments that have come up and are, are thinking about all this. Um, but again, you go, okay, well, worldwide or regional are, are two very different things. And of course, within the EU, there's, um, it's, it's, it might be a little bit easier, if you will, to create at least a set of guidelines, if not legislation, then that would be worldwide for sure. Yeah, I, I think it would be difficult. I mean, I just look at the United States. It's, we don't have a privacy law here. We don't have a national privacy law because it's not possible. <laughs> I mean, they can't agree. California has a privacy law. Illinois has the bio, uh, the uh, BIPA the uh, information privacy law. There are little pockets and bits and pieces, but the idea of trying to have a global policy to me is daunting. How do you, how do you square the United States, the UK, the EU, China, Russia, countries in Africa, South America? How do you do that? Culturally, we're not all together, and so I don't know how I don't know how that could be done. A great example of this all actually is also in Sweden. So when I was looking at privacy rights in Sweden, um, it was surprising to me to realize that actually in a lot of Scandinavian countries, it's all about transparency and openness. So things like tax records are a matter of public record, right? So they value in a lot of ways transparency and openness over privacy as a cultural phenomenon. So again, as you say, completely right. And sometimes what we think is being right or fair or ethical is just a matter of context. But also remember that certain certain concepts like these change, right? I mean, when I grew up, it was totally normal to have your name and address and your phone number in the phone book. Uh, I don't have my phone number online right now because I don't want people to, you know, call me who I haven't given my number to. So these concepts also change over time. Yeah, the, um, if you look at, like, for instance, the trolley car example, um, um, back when I was at Santa Clara, we were looking at um, cultural differences and how that question would be answered if you had an autonomous vehicle that had to decide between killing the people in the car, killing the old people, killing the young people, killing the doctor, what have you. And different cultures had completely different responses. We, you know, one culture would say it's we really... Um, uh, want to protect the elderly and the wisdom that they have, so kill the young people. And another one would say, well, those old people have lived their lives and had experiences, save the young people. So it, it, it just, it, it highlights for me the, the difficulty of trying to have a one-size-fits-all um, WIPO-type solution for, for these really thorny questions. Fantastic. We are coming up to one minute to go. Um, so I'd like to thank you guys so much for participating and telling us a little bit about uh, synthetic media, the law and, and all the different issues. Uh, we covered a large range of things. Uh, we talked about consent. We talked about uh, the role of legislators and whether they're equipped to build new laws for the future that we're gonna face. Um, we talked about Generation Z and uh, young people in terms of their behaviors and how that's gonna impact how laws and regulations are made in the future. Um, we talked about the right to publicity and how that varies across different jurisdictions. Uh, and I think that in some way, we, we had a great discussion about um, synthetic media today, which will be more and more a part of our lives and uh, kind of a legal and regulatory implications. Um, I think that everybody watching will be able to find more um, in some of the show notes uh, in the chat. And I would love to thank you guys so much for participating. It's really been um, a wonderful chat uh, and really look forward to hoping uh, to having you guys um, on panels where we dive into maybe specific legal things, uh, legal issues and really deep dive into them um, in upcoming uh, versions of Synthetic Futures, uh, which we will run this kind of um, panel session uh, three to four times a year. So thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.